to officially welcome you to our web conference today, Integrating Health Equity into Sexual and Domestic Violence Prevention, Key Concepts and Components of Strategies and Approaches. Prevent Connect is a national project of Valor US, sponsored by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided in this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the US government, CDC, or uh, Valor. <laughs> I almost said our old name. Okay, so our objectives today, we're really looking to um, gain a deeper understanding of what health equity through violence prevention can look like in practice. We have some really um, exciting examples of this in practice that will be shared today. Also thinking about how do we kind of translate these concepts into on the ground program development and implementation and what kinds of strategies and partnerships um, do we need to be thinking about in order to address things like social determinants of health? So those are all things that we'll be getting to today. Um, we did, if this perhaps is um, a newer conversation for you in terms of like health equity approaches, in 2022, we did host a three-part series on health equity approaches to preventing violence. And the first session in that series in particular may be really helpful if you're still kind of building your understanding of health equity. Um, sessions two and three included some real life examples of addressing the underlying conditions that contribute to violence, and then also looking more deeper at partnerships. Um, so we'll put the link to where you can find those recordings in the chat. And then again, I mentioned that we're hosting a session tomorrow, but over the summer, we launched a five-part series called Health Equity in Practice. And that series has really been focused on building capacity around approaching sexual violence prevention through increasing equity. So it can also be a really good primer for building skills to approach prevention through a health equity lens. And we'll put a link if you're interested in learning more about that series. And I want to just kind of start with um, this health equity definition that comes from CDC's What is Health Equity? And it's pretty straightforward. Um, it says that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health, no matter their identity, no matter where they live. And so while that's straight, pretty straightforward, what keeps us from achieving health equity, that's where it becomes more complex. And it's how we can integrate health equity into violence prevention that can be more difficult to imagine in practice. And so, you know, the lack of health equity that so many communities experience is not just something that happens, right? It, it's, it's by design. The laws and social practices that we've created um, and continue to create, place more value on some, some lives than others, largely based on race and class. Um, and we also know that the governing process plus economic and social policies and culture and social values can affect everything from paid sick leave to housing to education. And these things are really deeply embedded into our social fabric. Um, and this is what we would consider or call uh, so structural determinants of health. So when we're thinking about the social, political, and economic mechanisms that make our world kind of work, that's what we would call the structural determinants of health. They are really what create inequities based on race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and other social factors. And they're what impact the conditions that people live their lives in. So they're the things that impact our communities. They drive inequities by causing fewer opportunities for people to access jobs, education, housing, things like healthcare. And it's really hard to obtain your highest level of health without access to things like good jobs and schools and safe, affordable homes. And I want to go back just really briefly to the image that was on this slide. Um, this was taken from an organization that um, has youth really leading health equity approaches. And so they spend a lot of time looking at how to message health equity in a way that can make sense to a large audience. Um, and so this, this image is really showing us that environment has a larger impact 
oftentimes than just individual behaviors when it comes to health. That if you put a fish uh, in a bowl that is it's safe, the bowl is not cracked, there's um, clean water, it is probably going to have a better chance of being happy, safe, and healthy. If you look at the fish on the right, no matter what this fish does, the fact that its bowl is cracked, that its water is dirty, it can do all of the things that it has control over, but it may not be able to reach its full health potential based on its environment. That's just something to keep in mind as we go through um, our conversation today, that we're really thinking about environment. And so it's, it's really not enough for us to understand that there are inequities in health and safety um, and where people live their lives, where they live, learn, work, and play. We have to really understand how those inequities came to exist. And so a health equity approach to violence prevention means that we're addressing the ways that racism has led to oppressive laws, policies, practices, and social norms. We're doing that by removing barriers and creating accessible access to power. And then we can better address the social and structural determinants of health and improve the conditions where people live, work, and play in order to achieve health equity and eliminate violence in communities. Um, so it's really kind of something that um, it's, a, it's a process. And like with most things in prevention or with anything in prevention, there isn't one way to increase health equity. There isn't one way to prevent violence. There isn't one way to increase health equity. Instead, there are many different opportunities for us to incorporate health equity into the various aspects of a violence prevention strategy or approach. And that is largely what we'll be thinking about today. So there are some places that we can, we can kind of start. We can start thinking about integrating health equity through the strategies and approaches that we're implementing. We might ask ourselves questions about what we are implementing. What is the content like? What are the key messages? How does the prevention strategy come to be? How is it designed? Um, are there policy components and what are those policy components? We can ask things like, does the content of our strategy prioritize people that are experiencing the highest rates of violence? We can ask if it addresses the social determinants of health, which we're gonna learn more about today. Does it create a narrative about our violence issue that helps people be able to connect the issue to their values? Um, and then is there ongoing capacity to continuously work on improving the quality of life for people? Um, there's no end point, right? It, it, something that should be sustainable and really rooted in the community. So with that, um, I would love to just hear from you all about one of the questions for us to start thinking about. And that is, how does your prevention approach or strategy prioritize those who are experiencing the most burden and, the, and have the most need in terms of sexual and domestic violence? Um, and so we'll pop that chat question into the chat and see what um, you all are thinking and what you're doing about that. We'll come back to see what's coming up in the chat in just a minute, but I am really excited to be able to introduce you to um, our guests today because they are really going to be able to share with us what it looks like to impact the social determinants of health, what this looks like in practice. So I'm excited to introduce you to Belinda Flores from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment to Christina Holt from the University of Kansas, Kansas Center for Community Health and Development, and to Gabby Boyle from Sexual Trauma and Abuse Care Center. Belinda, Christina, Gabby, welcome. Um, how are you all doing today? Hello, thank you, doing good. Great to see everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so excited about this important conversation today. I'm doing great. Also echoing what Christina said. Um, and yeah, happy to be here. Amazing. 
Well, I'd love if you all would just kind of start walking us through what's happening in Kansas, how you all have been approaching integrating health equity into your prevention work and sharing what that looks like in practice. Absolutely. Um, we can start by just some quick self introductions. So I can start. Um, I'm with the Center for Community Health and Development at the University of Kansas. And we have the deep honor of working alongside the um, RPE grantees in Kansas and supporting the participatory evaluation and technical assistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm Belinda Flores. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And so uh, I help oversee uh, the sexual violence program at, in Kansas, and we administer funds from the CDC's uh, RPE grant funding um, into different communities like uh, where the Sexual Trauma and Abuse Care Center is with Gabby. Yeah, um, and um, I'm at the Sexual Trauma and Abuse Care Center. We are a sexual violence agency. We're located in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, we've been around for a little bit over 50 years, um, and we provide um, free low barrier therapy, um, as well as advocacy and response. And then we also have um, a small but mighty prevention and education team uh, which I am a part of. So I'll kick it back to Christina and Belinda to get us started. Excellent. And I can attest to the small but mighty uh, statement there, Gabby. Um, at the Center for Community Health and Development, we're a nonprofit center based at the University of Kansas with the mission of supporting community health and development through participatory research and evaluation, teaching and training, and technical support and capacity building. Our center um, provides support for public health and social change efforts, both here in Kansas and in the U.S. and some internationally. And we're so honored to provide the um, supports for participatory evaluation and technical assistance for sexual violence primary prevention here in Kansas. We are also home of the Community Toolbox, which is free online resources for community change and improvement. And at the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, uh, we're working to improve the health and environment of all Kansans. And with the Sexual Violence Prevention Program, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we help administrate CDC RPE funds, um, as well as the sexual offense portion of the Preventative Health and Health Services Block Grant and um, support sexual violence prevention efforts in um, whatever ways we can throughout the state. So we're going to tell you a little bit um, kind of about the approach that we're taking in Kansas. And we're starting with this uh, quote from the CDC that we must understand and address the factors that put people at risk or protect them from violence. And in Kansas, we're working really hard to focus on addressing community and societal level risk and protective factors for sexual violence. So things like poverty and employment, gender pay equity and workplace policies, community norms and social connectedness. And we are using the CDC's socio-ecological model framework for prevention to guide our efforts. And we are, um, focusing on things specifically at those outer layers of the community and societal levels. So things like changing the physical and social environment and at the societal level, things like changing housing and economic policies and social norms. We know that societal factors can include things like the health and economic, educational and so social policies that help to maintain uh, social and inequities between groups and society. Prevention level, um, prevention strategies at that level include efforts to strengthen household financial security, education and employment opportunities, and other policies that affect structural determinants of health. 
the beginning, we tried to do uh, conversations and discussion about what it means to move upstream in our efforts to address sexual violence. And we had all different kinds of partners around the table coming from lots of different approaches. And we talked about moving from a crisis response, which is absolutely necessary, but also in insufficient for preventing suffering at the population level. We utilized resources such as the CDC's veto violence materials and sexual violence prevention resources for action to help reframe the work and show its interconnection to other community issues that partners deeply care about. Things like how it intersects with the existing community health assessments and community health improvement plans, areas like healthy youth development, poverty and jobs, behavioral health, addressing food insecurity, access to affordable housing, leadership development, and improvements to the built environment. So this public health parable that you see pictured here can be helpful for thinking about our work and quote unquote moving upstream. In this story, a person fishing in a river sees a person being carried downstream, struggling for life. They pull that person out, but more and more people um, keep being carried downstream, needing to be rescued. Exhausted from constantly pulling people out of the river, they go upstream to try to figure out why people are falling into the water in the first place. They notice people falling from a steep embankment and there's no fence and decide they need to build a fence to keep people from falling into the river in the first place. This parable moves from intervention uh, downstream, which is individual intervention after harm has taken place, to upstream community level primary prevention. Of course, it is essential to pull the drowning people from the water and to bring them to safety. And we also need to address any long-term consequences they might have as a result of falling into the water but it is in moving upstream that we can um, vitally prevent uh, harm from taking place. And so we need to pay attention to community structures that can help change outcomes. As we dive in, we're going to just define a few more concepts. So health equity is a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible for all. Health inequities are conditions that are produced by social, political, and economic factors at play in societal structures. Health inequities are unjust because they are avoidable and they are preventable. They are a consequence of our current systems. Thus, we can intervene. Health equity is both an ethical and a human rights principle. As you can see in this image from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, equality and equity are not the same thing. Distributing resources equally would not lead to equitable outcomes in this scenario. We must keep in mind as we are working towards equity, that might mean tailoring our efforts appropriately for different populations that are experiencing disparities. Oh, okay. And one other thing I wanted to cover is social determinants of health. This is a conceptualization. Um, this graphic that you see here is from Healthy People 2030. Social determinants are the conditions in the environments where people born and live that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes. So this shows some of the different social determinants. Examples of social determinants of health include things like access to nutritious food and enough food, physical activity opportunities, safe, affordable housing, transportation, uh, the neighborhood built environment, racism, discrimination, social connectedness, education, job opportunities, and income. And I think Ashley might have a quiz for us. 
Yes. So actually, before we go there, I want to just check in briefly with Janae and see um, what's been coming up in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. So we asked everyone a little bit earlier today um, to tell us how their prevention approaches and strategies prioritize those with the most burden and need. And I have loved seeing everyone's answers come in. So I'm seeing things like prioritizing youth in our programs and policies, like relying on data to inform our approaches and make sure that they're reflective of community needs, focusing on safe environments and moving past the individual and relational levels of the social ecological model. I saw lifting up Black and African American women and members of the LGBTQ plus community, culturally specific programs, and even ongoing trainings for prevention staff to make sure that they're rooted in health equity. It's all great things. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you all so much for sharing about um, what that looks like in your work and in your community. Um, and thanks for pulling that out, Janae. That was super helpful. Um, so we do want to move to our next question, and this is actually going to be a polling question. Um, so let me pull that up for y'all and let me launch it. And the question is asking what conditions, so what are those conditions in the environments where we live, work, and play is your prevention work addressing? Um, and so these are uh, the categories that Christina just shared with us. So education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, the neighborhood and built environment, economic stability, or the social and community context. Um, and we are going, I'm gonna get, let this get to 70% participation. Maybe we'll get higher. Um, and then I will go ahead and share what, uh, what folks are saying. But we're really thinking about, you know, how is our work having an impact on environment? Because as we saw with that little fishbowl, the environment that we live in um, is, has often more uh, impact on our health than our individual choices. So, um, we're not quite to 70% yet, but it seems that there's been a, a pause in people responding. So I think for the sake of time, I am going to go and end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. And Valerie, I see your note. I'm not sure why you're not seeing the poll, um, but we'll send you a message about that. Um, all right. so going to go ahead and share the results with you all. And Christina, Belinda, Gabby, you'll see that the majority of folks are um, impacting or addressing the social and community context. Um, we do have, I think, in second place, looking at education access and quality, followed by healthcare access and quality, and then pretty split neighborhood and built environment and economic stability. Um, so that is what is going on in this room. Um, I'm going to pass it back to y'all. I'll stop sharing. It's all yours. All right, so first to give you some context on the sexual violence prevention work here in Kansas. Um, here we have our five year comprehensive plan to prevent sexual and domestic violence. Uh, so this current plan is ranging from 2019 through 2024. Um, and this is created with a variety of partners and stakeholders within Kansas, um, such as the Governor's Grant Office, Kansas Children's Service League, which is a chapter of Prevent Child Abuse America. And then we have different local rape crisis centers, as well as dual agencies um, and various other partners and stakeholders as well. And uh, this group comes together to create a plan that guides our sexual violence prevention work 
And our mission is for all people in Kansas to have a safe and healthy life and community free of sexual and domestic violence. So um, I'll go over some of or not some, but all of our goals in that plan. Um, the first one is decrease social norms that lead to oppression, including male superiority and sexual entitlement. Um, so this male superiority can lead to uh, justification of violence towards women. And um, with the la latest poll that we did, um, a lot of you said that you're working in social and community context, and I feel like that social determinant um, is kind of in the background of this goal. Our second goal is to increase equity for people who experience gender-based oppression. So gender equity is necessary to develop and achieve a safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. And as with our first goal, extreme applications of these gendered social norms can support the inequities between uh, males, females, gender nonconforming individuals, and the male perpetration of violence against those people. Goal three is decrease unequal burden of risk factors for sexual and domestic violence. Uh, so again, I feel like in the root of this goal is a lot of the social determinants of health um, can be a factor of how that unequal burden exists and um, what contributes to that. Goal four, increase efforts uh, at the individual relationship, community, and societal levels to prevent sexual and domestic violence before it occurs. Um, today we're kind of talking more so about that community level, but uh, it's important to recognize all of those levels. Goal five, increase the capacity to monitor, evaluate, and improve primary prevention in a data-driven and evidence-based manner. Um, and uh, with this, we hope that that is done through considering uh, health equity with that data as well. Goal six, obtain resources to address prevention of sexual and domestic violence. Uh, not much to add there, just looking for additional resources to support our work. Thanks, Belinda, for sharing the big goals of the comprehensive plan. I'm going to share a bit about kind of the model or approach that we're using to undergird um, the work. So this is the Institute of Medicine's framework for collaborative public health action for working together for community change and improvement. And it kind of gives us a lens for approaching the multi-sectoral and multi-level community change work. Community engagement and trust and relationship building is essential throughout all phases of this iterative process. Um, the process starts there at A with assessment and collaborative planning to really support deeper understanding of the situation locally and understanding um, the risk and protective factors that are most contributing to what, what folks are seeing locally, which can inform priority setting and collaborative planning for change and improvement in the strategic plan, which leads to targeted action and intervention, working to involve stakeholders across different sectors and areas of the community on specific community changes. And then those community and system changes, things like environmental changes, changes in policies, new programs and practices, um, added up over time, those can ultimately lead to changing those population level outcomes that we care about. Um, of course, the intended effect of the community and systems changes is widespread behavior change related to sexual violence prevention at the population level. And um, then ultimately we are able to look at over time how those things are adding up to um, changes at the population level. 
each of the community level efforts that you uh, will hear about today have been following um, their version of this participatory model from an engaged community assessment and prioritization process to planning and improvement to implementation of um, community and system changes. And um, also use a participatory evaluation approach to help um, answer questions about the initiative Things like whether those that are most affected by the issues are involved in the planning and implementation efforts, whether there are resulting changes in communities and systems, who is being affected by the changes, what factors are associated with the group's ability to bring about community and systems change, and how ultimately those changes are contributing to changes in behavior and whether there are associated improvements in population level outcomes over time. The Kansas communities are using an online system called the Community Checkbox Evaluation System, which is customized to help the stakeholders answer important questions for their initiatives. The system supports their systematic documentation of their collaborative community change efforts and enables reporting at the level, level of each community as well as statewide. This helps with institutional knowledge and history, supports communities in telling their stories and celebrating successes, and also with um, sharing with stakeholders and reporting to funders. Now we are gonna go through the four uh, funded communities throughout Kansas that are receiving RPE funding from uh, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. As you can see um, on the right side here, there's kind of three clustered up there. Those are more uh, urban, suburban communities. And then on the left western side of Kansas uh, is a rural community. And uh, to give kind of some knowledge on Kansas, if you're not familiar, a lot of that Western part is rural communities. Um, and those three that are close together is where a lot of the population lies in Kansas. Um, and while they're close together, uh, they have different strategies and are working with different populations. So starting with the one from Western Kansas is Finney County. And Finney County is located in, or their main city is Garden City. And uh, this coalition's efforts are led by Live Well Finney County, which is a health coalition. Um, some for an idea of what the population is like, Garden City population was 28,151 in the 2020 census. Um, I also forgot to mention on the last slide, all of these communities did their own assessment at the beginning of receiving our funding. And so they all have different strategies that they are working on. Finney Counties is um, working towards youth well-being, improving neighborhood connectedness, and increasing civic engagement. Um, so I'll kind of be focusing on the civic engagement piece, because um, that's especially important to Finney County, as they have a pretty diverse uh, community, where uh, there is 50.3% of Hispanic and Latino uh, individuals and of individuals age five and over, 43.3% speak a language other than English at home. Um, so there's a lot of community that is uh, speaking multiple languages, over 20 uh, languages are spoken in Finney County and a large portion of this is due to a meatpacking plant located there, drawing in uh, different refugee and immigrant populations for work. And so that's where um, a lot of the diversity lies. So going back to the civic engagement portion, um, 
they recognize the importance of having leadership that really reflects their community. Um, as of now, a lot of their leadership are older men, and that's just not a good reflection of what their community actually looks like. So they want to not only get people involved in being engaged with uh, their civic process, but they also want to provide leadership trainings to those of more marginalized uh, identities. One way that they're doing this is next month, they've worked with Kansas Leadership Center and they are offering leadership opportunities um, coming to their community as a lot of times uh, people can't get away from uh, work or just their life to attend that sort of training. And uh, the person that they have brought in to provide this training is uh, they speak both English and Spanish to hopefully be able to provide the training to more people and make it more accessible throughout the community. Hi again. Um, so I can speak a little bit to the work that's ongoing in Lawrence, Kansas and Douglas County, Kansas. Um, so um, as I mentioned, I'm from the Sexual Trauma and Abuse Care Center. And in 2018, um, as this um, funding became available, um, my organization, the Care Center, approached Live Well Douglas County, which is a public health coalition similar to Live Well Finney County that Belinda was just describing, um, who had previously um, done a lot of like interdisciplinary public health work. So we approached them about the possibility of kind of collaborating to form a sexual violence prevention work group as a part of Live Well Douglas County. Um, obviously, this was an easy yes for everybody involved. Livel was happy um, to host us, and I'm super grateful um, for them doing so. Um, and we were happy to kind of have a little bit more access um, to that interdisciplinary public health space. Um, so as Christina mentioned and Belinda mentioned, um, all of the communities that received um, uh, this funding uh, ran their own community assessments. And um, in Douglas County, our community needs assessment consisted both of gathering pre-existing data from sources like um, the census, uh, from sources like um, our county's community health plan. And we also generated some data of our own um, to try to assess um, which shared risk and protective factors were the most prevalent in Douglas County. And what we found from that needs assessment was that in Douglas County, um, there's a significant and persistent uh, gender pay gap, um, meaning that um, women were being paid um, consistently and persistently less than men. Um, and of course, um, the more that we analyze that pay gap, there are also major inequities um, between folks um, who are not white, who are not able-bodied. Um, we also found that there were high unemployment rates and diminished economic opportunities, high rates of folks experiencing severe housing cost burden, which is a term that I'll um, define a little bit more in depth here in a moment, um, high percentages of households experiencing food insecurity, high rates of binge drinking and a high alcohol outlet density, meaning there's a high density of places where you can either purchase or consume on-site alcohol. Um, we also found in this assessment that again, um, certain groups of folks or certain people in our community um, were disproportionately experiencing risk for sexual violence. Um, we know that our black community, um, which comprises 5.4% of the population here, has significantly higher rates of poverty at about 26% um, than the overall county. Um, similarly, our Hispanic and Latina population um, experience high rates of poverty as well at about 28%. Um, Folks who um, experience uh, homelessness are more likely to be Black and Indigenous, um, and we also have a higher rate of women experiencing homelessness in Douglas County than in Kansas or the national average. 
Um, so from kind of these results, we pulled out three focus areas um, in which we wanted to kind of um, narrow our strategies down. And those focus areas are um, gender pay and equity, um, safe and affordable housing, and then alcohol use and alcohol outlet density. Um, so with our alcohol outlet density strategies, um, we uh, focused on a bystander intervention training called the Safe Bar Alliance, um, as well as passing an ordinance in the city of Lawrence that requires um, anyone establishing or anyone applying for or renewing a liquor license at an establishment um, to attend mandatory sexual violence prevention training. Um, this is one of the first um, ordinances of its kind in the country um, and has been um, honestly really successful in terms of facilitating those trainings and getting to have conversations with establishments that we may not um, reach otherwise in our prevention and education programming. Um, related to our gender pay and equity strategy, um, we have been participating in and supporting um, the conven convening of um, our county's um, community health plan. They have a focus area specifically related to anti-poverty work. Um, and so we have been in that space thinking about how we can increase equitable employment opportunities, um, looking at um, how we can encourage workplaces to adopt um, workplace policies that are family friendly, um, meaning that they accommodate things like flexible scheduling, um, paid sick leave, paid maternal or paternal leave or parental leave, um, et cetera. And then um, what I'm going to focus on the most in the next couple of slides is the work that we've been doing in our housing focus area because it has been the most successful and has had the most kind of community momentum around it. Um, so when I started in this position um, almost three years ago, it was 2020, October 2020, COVID was, you know, we were like six months into COVID and um, it was becoming really clear how much um, the COVID-19 pandemic was um, magnifying um, pre-existing um, risk factors in our community. So there was a lot of community conversation, even outside of our work group, about the risk factors that we just, um, you know, discussed. But particularly, um, there was a huge conversation about housing. Um, and so as I started um, kind of getting my bearings in um, Lawrence Douglas County and Livewell Douglas County, um, I started to connect with stakeholders in the housing field. Um, for instance, folks working at like our um, community shelter, um, our Habitat for Humanity. Um, we have a nonprofit here called Tenants to Homeowners that helps. It's a it's a community land trust. So essentially, um, it maintains a stock of affordable housing for folks to purchase, um, et cetera. Just really trying to connect with all sorts of um, housing stakeholders and community partners. And we also formed relationships with folks working um, in a more um, uh, like governmental capacity, I guess I would say. Um, our city commission um, here, um, we built relationships with them as well as with city staff. So folks in our city attorney's office, um, folks in our city's um, affordable housing initiatives office, as well as volunteer boards. Um, in our city looking at things like enforcing our discrimination ordinances, et cetera. Um, again, we just really, um, I tried to build a bunch of diverse relationships and bring folks to the table so that we could have all sorts of perspectives there. Um, so as I started to connect with folks in the housing sphere, um, I started to do quite a bit of research about what housing inequities look like in Lawrence and Douglas County. Um, we have a majority renter occupied um, community by a slight majority, um, a little bit over 50% of our households um, are renter households. Um, our median rent is about $1,100, which depending on where you are in the country, that may seem inexpensive, um, but in Kansas, our minimum wage is $7.25. Um, and from 2000 to 2018, 
rents in Lawrence have increased by $3,600 annually, while median income for renters has only increased about $8,000 annually, which means that almost half of that um, income increase um, is going towards covering that rental increase. So our incomes have not really cut up um, with our rent increases. Um, our median household income is about 56K um, and we have about a 16% poverty rate. Um, also of note um, is that we have three universities in Douglas County and a student population of about um, 28,000. So um, those are some factors that were kind of um, being taken into consideration as we started to think about how do we connect to housing. So we mentioned earlier that we have a high uh, amount of renters experiencing cost burden. And so what um, housing cost burden is, um, is a term that refers to um, somebody who is paying over one third or more of their income towards rent or towards housing costs. So 56% of renters as of 2018, um, we don't have current numbers, I would imagine it's a bit higher now, um, are experiencing um, cost burden. Half of that 56% is experiencing severe cost burden, which means that they are spending 50% or more of their income towards rent and housing costs. Um, so we took all of this sort of demographic um, information in, um, and then we started to compare it to our services and kind of the work that was already being done in our housing sphere. So um, as I mentioned, we do have a couple of um, community shelters in town. Um, one is a, our community shelter, it's a general population shelter. We also have um, a domestic violence shelter in addition to um, an organization called Family Promise, um, which is a faith-based organization that provides shelter as well. Um, however, all of those organizations are significantly at capacity and have um, either um, are not able to meet the need of the population or have folks that are waiting a very long time to access their emergency sheltering services. Additionally, our housing authority um, in Lawrence and Douglas County um, had about 800 active choice um, or active housing choice voucher users. So there were 800 people that were actively housed as of September 2021 using housing choice vouchers. Um, however, and there was a wait list at that time also of over 400 people, um, many of whom who were being told that they would expect an 18 to 24 month wait. So while we do have quite a uh, many households that are actively housed using that program, there was a major bottleneck because there was not enough housing accepting housing choice vouchers um, to accommodate them all. Additionally, um, we have a very successful rental assistance program um, administered in part um, through our county. Um, and so what we saw was, again, um, there were a lot of folks receiving rental assistance um, but what, what I was hearing anecdotally from housing partners was um, either their landlords were refusing to accept rental assistance or once their lease um, was up for renewal, um, the landlords would no longer choose to renew that lease if in the past they had used rental assistance, citing that as a reason for a non-renewal of lease. So um, considering all of this kind of, um, you know, the fact that um, one, there was a major need for more emergency housing and sheltering, but um, that was not something that we really had the capacity to do in any meaningful way, right? Like we do not have the ability to build additional community sheltering through this RPE funding. Um, additionally, knowing that we have this big bottleneck in terms of our housing authority voucher programs and our rental assistance programs, we started to look at, okay, what can we do um, to ease the burden um, on those service providers and on those programs and get more people successfully housed with the resources that already exist in our community. Um, and again, that's where that kind of, as you all are thinking about prevention strategies, particularly the community and systems-based prevention strategies, it's extremely overwhelming. And something that we found really grounding in the work group was this question of, 
what is going to make the most impact versus what realistically are we going to be able to achieve? Yes, building 5,000 houses is going to make an extreme impact on our community. However, um, our sort of ragtag bunch of housing service providers um, and community organizers um, and folks like Belinda and Christina, um, you know, we were not going to be able to do that. Um, so instead, we started to look at, again, what can we do to leverage these resources that already exist? And that's where um, we sort of settled on investigating a type of policy called uh, source of income protections. Many communities already have protections like these in place. Um, over 20 states and 100 municipalities have created policies like the one that I'm about to describe. Many of these have existed for um, you know, uh, decades, um, but in Kansas, um, nowhere in the state, no municipality um, had any protections for source of income. So what that means is we do not have anything in law that says that landlords cannot discriminate against a tenant on the basis of how they are paying their rent, which meant that it is perfectly legal to say, I am not going to house you because you are paying for your um, rent using a housing choice voucher or because you are using rental assistance or because you are receiving financial support from family or friends. Um, this seemed really achievable, right? Like it's something that already was passed in a lot of other communities. And additionally, it's something that has been very well researched um, and recommended by multiple different um, housing advocacy groups, um, such as HUD, such as the American Bar Association, the Low Income Housing Coalition, um, et cetera. What the research that we were doing um, found in terms of what creating this type of policy um, could affect was um, that there were significant um, benefits um, and positive outcomes to having these types of protections. Voucher holders, um, uh, the, the time spent um, waiting for housing decreased by 14%, which again, when you have a 24 month long wait list is really major. Um, there was a lot of concern about whether or not this would potentially raise rents in our community uh, in the sense that landlords would raise rents in retaliation, but there was no documented research um, to prove that this was um, a thing. Um, we also found that um, in communities without source of income protections, 77, so a lot of folks using housing choice vouchers were being rejected by landlords. Um, and this number drops to 33% in communities with source of income protection. So again, really major. There are also better housing mobility outcomes for elderly folks um, and those with large families. And while Lawrence is not a particularly segregated community, we're actually really integrated when you look at um, who is living where. Um, in communities with source of income protections, um, there was less racial segregation. Um, Oops, sorry. So we took all of this research and we took all of the relationships that we developed um, and essentially just presented this to folks, right? A lot of housing stakeholders were on the ground um, getting people housed, getting them connected to rental assistance. They did not necessarily have the capacity to do this sort of research, and they certainly didn't have the capacity um, to spend their work days getting coffee with strangers, um, sharing this research. They didn't have the capacity to be, um, you know, um, presenting this to boards like our Affordable Housing Advisory Board. Um, this funding, and I would, I would imagine the majority of funding that um, folks who are here receive does restrict lobbying. Um, however, we were never lobbying. We were researching, we were preparing materials, we were asking um, what is the need in terms of gathering information about this policy and how can we help you communicate that research? Um, so this process started, I saw a question in the chat that Christina had answered. Um, this process of investigating um, this type of policy uh, started in like um, winter, like January, February of 2022 or 2021, excuse me, but it wasn't passed until February, 2023. So it was a long process. Um, how, and the work is still ongoing, right? Like we're still thinking about what are ways that we can support the enforcement of this type of ordinance. 
Um, but it was something that we were really able to support in terms of providing that research and providing those communication skills and those education skills um, to make sure that the effect of this type of policy could be understood by our decision makers. Another thing, um, or a few other strategies that I want to talk about outside of um, source of income protections. Um, I mentioned earlier our um, bystander intervention program for our alcohol use strategy, which is called the Safe Bar Alliance. Um, and we just recently revised that curriculum um, to make it a little bit more, um, uh, I guess like systems-based, if that makes sense. So previously what this curriculum consisted of was consent education, um, definition and examples of sexual violence and harassment, um, and then bystander intervention skills. All of that is still in there, but we also added a conversation about the types of social norms um, and narratives that exist in the service industry that make things like the harassment of um, you know, service staff, bartenders, wait staff, um, event staff, so prevalent, that make um, sexual harassment by patrons um, towards other patrons, um, you know, so prevalent in bars. So we really um, moved away uh, from having what I would consider like a power neutral conversation um, where, you know, um, all of our education is focused on consent and definitions um, and instead tried to kind of shift the conversation towards um, what are the social norms and the community norms that are contributing to this? And how can we, as an establishment, as a city, as a community, like how can we create an environment where those norms do not exist? Um, so when we were coming into these establishments, only talking about consent, oftentimes what um, staff were leaving with was an understanding that sexual violence was one caused by a misunderstanding of consent or an inability to practice it, which we know is not true. Um, and two, we're coming away, even though we were focusing on bystander intervention, we're coming away with the sense that like, okay, it's my responsibility to keep myself safe from sexual violence. By switching to um, a less power neutral conversation, um, by switching to a conversation about community um, and social norms, um, we were able to kind of instead say it's everybody's responsibility to keep each other safe, right? And these are the things that are causing sexual violence in our community. A sense of entitlement, inequitable wages, um, unsafe working conditions, etc. Additionally, after source of income was passed in Lawrence in February, we, the work group, started working on a tenant experience survey. In doing research, there was no um, almost no research about what tenants were experiencing. Like it was extremely hard to find data about how many people were having their security deposits withhold, withheld, um, how many people were experiencing non-renewals, um, how many people, um, you know, had a safe and positive relationship with their landlord. Like no research had been done on that whatsoever in our community. And so for that reason, uh, we kind of decided to fill in that knowledge gap. Um, we created a comprehensive tenant survey that asked um, various questions about property maintenance, um, relationships with a manager or a landlord, um, questions about um, security deposit, evictions, non-renewals, um, perceived um, like neighborhood cohesion, all of these different things um, that may influence somebody's relationship to their housing. Um, and we actually just recently closed the response gathering um, period for that survey. Um, our goal was 1,050 responses. And Christina, you might have more updated numbers, but I think we're at 1,030-ish. Yeah. So um, that's huge. Um, for context, when we did our community needs assessment in 2018, um, I think we had somewhere in between like 75 to 100 respondents. Correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, but I think it was a smaller number with the social norms part. I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's okay. a lot smaller, though. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm super proud of the work group for being able to, again, like we leverage those partnerships. We leverage those relationships. We had people flyering. We had people tabling. Um, uh, to answer a question in the chat, Jenny, um, we do have 
at the end of the survey, there is a spot where somebody can write um, their name and their email address separate from the survey so that it's still anonymous. Um, and we will have a small amount of incentives um, to provide to folks, nothing crazy um, or extremely extravagant, probably um, a handful of gift cards. Um, however, I will say that a lot of the advertising that we did surrounding the survey did not highlight this incentive um, because, to be honest, we haven't really uh, been very confident that we're going to have a significant amount of incentive. Um, I think that the conversation and the momentum in the community was such that tenants wanted to have their voices heard. Um, our survey was 100% confidential. Everything was voluntary so folks could skip what they didn't want to. And there were also um, multiple points at the end of every section where somebody could freely write about their experiences or their perspective so that they would put it in their own words. Um, we're planning on conducting some follow-up interviews, creating some um, narrative like storytelling, um, uh, I don't know, reports or ways for folks to engage with our data as well as more of a quantitative analysis. Um, and then another thing that we've been doing that I'm super proud of is um, as the source of income ordinance was being passed, um, a uh, kind of budding um, tenant union started to form at the same time called Lawrence Tenants. And um, while the city commission was hearing, we had three city commission meetings um, surrounding source of income, um, one in October, one in November, and one in February. And this group, Lawrence Tenants, was turning people out um, to these meetings, making public comment in support of the ordinance, like really strengthening the effort. And also like it was cool because they would use um, you know, the information that we had, um, like the research that we had created um, in their public comments. So we had this like really great reciprocal relationship with these community organizers. Um, and because it's such a new organization, um, we've really been trying to kind of materially support them. So we were able to pay for um, a community organizing training through an organization called Midwest Academy, um, for these tenant organizers so that they could learn more um, concrete organizing skills and kind of build their capacity um, for doing more advocacy, for doing more activism where, you know, folks working in nonprofits can't necessarily. Um, we're also planning on sharing um, our data from that survey with them, as well as there was an option for folks at the end of the survey if they did want to get connected um, with Lawrence tenants to be notified of, um, uh, you know, either organizing activist um, community resource opportunities, there was an option for folks to opt into their mailing list. So again, we were kind of able to um, send folks their way because ultimately, you know, we want community organizers to be doing um, this work and not um, nonprofits. That's the most sustainable way to make it happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we've done in Lawrence um, and Douglas County. I'm going to kick it back over to Christina and Belinda um, to talk about uh, our other communities. Thank you, Gabby. And I'm actually going to pop in real quick before it goes back to Christina and Belinda. And I just wanted to let everyone know that um, Gabby actually presented at the National Sexual Assault Conference in August. And that session was recorded um, and we'll be making that available on the Prevent Connect website in the coming weeks. Um, so if you want to hear more from Gabby, learn more about this specific work around housing, um, that will be available. And there's there's so much to unpack, Gabby, but you know, it's it's just it's really exciting to see how a local rape crisis center has been able to have such um, a presence and impact risk factors related to sexual violence through your work with um, the housing community and just seeing that as your prevention strategy in practice is so inspiring um, and a really cool lesson. So thank you so much for sharing about that and all of the other um, strategies that y'all have. I thought that your Safe Bar Alliance curriculum revision, such a good example of creating narrative change um, and really showing people where they can connect to violence prevention. Um, so thank you so, so much. 
Um, we did want to, Christina and Belinda, before we turn it back to you, we'd love to hear from our audience again, thinking about the environmental conditions, policies, programs, or practices um, that you think your community, you know, might address to reduce inequities that are happening. Um, and so, it, you know, in Lawrence, Kansas, it, housing was a big one. Um, so just thinking about your community and what you know about the conditions, what are um, a policy program or a practice that uh, the community might address to reduce inequities? We'll come back to that. Um, but at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Christina and Belinda. Thank you so much. I am going to share a little bit about what's happening in Johnson County. Johnson County is um, urban slash suburban Kansas City, and it, its work is being led by the health department there in partnership with MOXA. And they had similar community engaged assessment and planning efforts uh, like you've heard about. So I'm gonna um, kind of fast forward a little bit to what they found. So some of the key risk factors that their assessment process uncovered um, for them were a persistent gender pay gap, um, income inequality, uh, societal income inequality and poor neighborhood connectedness and cohesion. So we know that female to male median income ratio in Johnson County is 72 cents on the dollar. And that trend was true for all racial and ethnic groups, um, but was even uh, worse for um, African Americans and American uh, Indian or Alaska Native women. Um, whose median incomes were approximately 45,000, while their male counterparts had an income of 64,000. Um, we also know that um, women are more likely to be below the poverty level, even if they are employed, and that's a 1.32 female to male ratio, and women are more likely um, to not be fully employed. Um, and that's a 0.74 female to male ratio of being underemployed. So to address this disparity in gender pay equity, the coalition formed a gender pay equity work group or subcommittee. And that group has been working on supporting policies and systems changes in local employers to become more supportive of their employees. Um, things like supportive um, flexible schedules, uh, accommodations for elder care, um, supportive breastfeeding policies, et cetera. Um, and the group has been partnering with Kansas Children's Services League and Power of the Positive Initiative, which is supporting local employers and administering surveys to get their employees feedback on current conditions and what family-friendly policies they would like to see put into place. And then they're able to provide free technical assistance and support as they identify potential improvements. So this has been a beautiful collaboration. Um, all of the parties and the work group recently uh, hosted a family-friendly workplace uh, summit to reach additional uh, employers and share ideas and build excitement and momentum for the initiative. We know that it is good business for employers, good for gender pay equity, and good for um, kiddos. Neighborhood support and cohesion, where neighbors trust and support each other, is another important factor for preventing sexual violence. And we know that high support and cohesion is a protective factor. Uh, and people who lack social support from family, friends, and the community um, also are more likely to um, perpetrate sexual violence. So um, they decided to uh, take that on as another area um, and have formed a, a work group around uh, that goal area. Um, they distributed a survey, 844 Johnson County residents took that survey uh, related to community support and connectedness. And 
really got a lot of feedback around um, low levels of community connectedness. And so they've been working on uh, different angles. Most recently, they're working on a literal community connectedness through the built environment. So one example is a central resource library and a big newish park and an elementary school are all residing closely together. And the city council is interested in increasing utilization of these assets. So they are working on designing interesting way finding signage around the neighborhood and the park and the library. And this is what the work group is working on and um, getting public input um, into the process. Um, they are also working on a community uh, time banking initiative or like a skills swap. Uh, they also recently forged toward that end a pretty unlikely partnership with emergency preparedness. So emergency preparedness is also trying to increase connectedness because also in the event of a disaster, it's helpful if folks know each other. So very different ends, but their strategies actually are, uh, there's a lot of alignment. So they are collaborating on a Know Your Neighbor initiative where they're going to be distributing um, like worksheets that can be shared among neighbors. Um, and uh, so that is a pretty fun collaboration, I think. They're also working with local government and uh, youth to design and implement a playground that is designed for girls by girls. So there are a lot of male centering spaces, but not so much for our youth females. So this is another effort to create a community space for an interaction and building connection and support. And that initiative has been approved. Uh, the city has funded it and it is in its final planning uh, and implementation stages. Lastly is Wyandotte County and their, their efforts are led by the Metropolitan Organization to Counter Sexual Assault, also known as MOXA for short. Uh, they also work closely with the Unified Government Health Department, which really helps uh, this coalition be integrated within the Community Health Improvement Plan. So Wyandotte County's main city is Kansas City, Kansas. It has a population of around 154,000 and their population is 21% black and 31% Hispanic to give an idea of some of those demographics. Their strategic plan consists of community prevention through environmental design. You might be familiar with the term SEPTED, that's what that stands for. And they also work towards social norms change. Uh, for the SEPTED strategies, uh, they bring together community members to examine how an area's physical design can influence human behavior, reduce crime, fear of crime, and improve quality of life. And a unique partnership that their SEPTED subcommittee has had in the past is with an organization called Bike Walk KC. And that organization works to redefine streets as places that people can build a culture of active living. So they're looking to get people to walk and bike in their communities where the uh, Wyandotte County Coalition is looking to create safer communities um, to look out for each other and follow SEPTED strategies, um, more thinking of that specifically neighborhood design part. Um, and currently they are partnering with or they have various partnerships within their subcommittee for SEPTED, but an active one is livable neighborhoods that um, really is useful in connecting them with different neighborhood organizations. And uh, then the Wyandotte County Coalition uses their 
um, community by design toolkit, which lists out different SEPTED principles. Um, so that's thinking about how the environmental design can be safer for the community, such as um, upkeeping of spaces, uh, making sure that like bushes are trimmed so it's less likely for someone to hide behind, um, keeping porch lights on so people know that there's someone there and helping kind of take care for that area. Um, so they go into neighborhood associations meetings and they'll educate them on those principles and then they use their toolkit to help them guide and uh, kind of empower the neighborhood to do an assessment for uh, what current things may need to be improved or what they're doing well. And um, the coalition will also help with uh, that assessment and thinking of different improvements and projects to follow that assessment. Thanks, Belinda. So as you all are supporting your own interventions at the community level and beyond, I did want to let you know that there are thousands of free resources available to you to support your community organizing in your communities um, on the community toolbox website. So if that is helpful to you, we invite you to um, make use of that um, it's a it's a free resource there. So we really hope today's conversation has been helpful in thinking about ideas for your own efforts. Would love to hear from you just any takeaways that you have and any next steps that you potentially envision as your communities seek to move upstream um, for the primary prevention of sexual violence. And I also did want to uplift too from the, the chat question that we asked just a moment ago, kind of based off of what you just said, Christina, too. We saw people talking about, so with what environmental conditions, policies, programs, or practices might your community address to reduce inequity? We saw affordable housing and finances, access to stable housing, again, access to public transportation and reliable technology all coming up in the chat. Thank you, Janae, for highlighting those. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes left, so we'd love to hear um, any kind of takeaways or next steps for you all in the audience. And if you have any questions um, for our presenters, we have some time for a couple of those. Um, you all did a great job, I think, answering questions as they came up. I think um, that you answered them all. Um, there was a question, and of course, now I'm trying to scroll up, but it was about um, if you're able to share the survey you used for measuring community connectedness. Sure, yeah, we'd, we'd be glad to share that. It's sort of an amalgam of some other surveys that have been created and distributed um, by folks that we found in the literature, and we'd, we'd be glad to share what we did. Thank you, Christina. Um, and I am just looking to- Ashley, I think Bernita has their hand up. Oh, I see that now. Um, let's see, Bernita. Um, I believe we have, uh, everyone is muted in this session um, because there are so many people. Um, Janae, are you able to assist with that? As folks are um, thinking of questions or reflections that you'd like to share, I also just wanted to be sure and share our contact information. It's been such a pleasure connecting this after afternoon and we certainly invite you to be in touch if we can be helpful in any way. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, Bernita, we sh you should be able to come off mute. 
if you're thank still you. interested. Yes, sure. thank you very much. Um, thank you for all of the information. We are presently in the Los Angeles area. They are working on uh, through our housing program because our housing is so short. They're working on an avenue for a centralized hotline. Uh, those of us who have worked on centralized hotlines cannot see it uh, coming to fruition because it re-traumatizes the uh, victims who have already given their information. So what you're sharing as far as prevention, that was one of the things we had a, a all day um, session on last Thursday. And that was one of the things that I brought up was the fact that we need to do um, uh, uh, prevention. You know, prevention is what we need because we can't keep building in LA, we're building houses housing on a regular basis because of the homeless situation we have here. And so the victims of domestic violence and interdepartment violence and sexual assault don't get the, the, the majority of it because we have such a homeless um, pro project here. So this information that you're sharing as far as prevention is concerned is extremely important for us. We are vast. Um, the county of Los Angeles is uh, bigger than a couple of states that we have. So, you know, we we're 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 in need so thank you so much for everything that you've put out there and just keep us in prayers as we strive to go forward and do the work that we've been called to do thank you thank you so much bernita and um it's it's so great to hear that this has resonated and provided um, maybe some places for you all to, to pivot and move forward. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I am from LA, so I know, I know how bad housing is. Um, well, gosh, I didn't, Janae, was there any other questions that you saw come up in the chat? I see lots of thank yous, um, which is always great to see. Thank you so much to our guests. You all have shared so much with us today. Yeah, I'm also not seeing a lot of questions. Lots of thank yous. If anyone, we have about two minutes left. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put it in or you can raise your hand. Um, um, great. Well, the uh, the slides are up on our website. Yes. And uh, then, the oh, I did see a question about sweet. Uh, you know what? That, what that, yeah, I just did. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, we do not provide CEUs for web conferences, but we do provide a certificate of attendance. Um, so uh, at the end of this session, you should see a link to a post evaluation survey. At the end of that, there is a link to download a certificate. Um, we also will make this recording available within a couple of days. So by the end of this week, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording. Um, and we'll also make the, the text chat without identifying information available um, for all of the links and all of that. But thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for all of the great participation. And again, Belinda, Gabby, Christina, Thank you so much for sharing about all this incredible work happening across the state of Kansas. Um, it's just so inspiring to see how communities across the state are really changing the conditions um, that people live in and increasing quality of life for um, community members through your violence prevention strategies. So thank you all so, so much. Um, it is 1230, my time. Other times it's a different time, but that'll conclude our session today. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you on a future Prevent Connect web conference. Thank you to Janae and thank you to our captioners. And as we close out, um, we will start putting folks in a waiting room. Um, so if you find yourself there, that is, we're going to do a quick debrief with our guests.
that all? Mm-hmm. Hello? Oh, we lost Christina. Uh-oh. Did we put Christina in the waiting room or did Christina I don't see leave? her. I do not. Okay. I don't see her in the waiting room. Also, did we stop recording? Oh. Now we did. <laughs>